at Roosevelt. We are a student-led public policy advocacy and research group, and we are so thrilled to be working with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation on this event and with Reverse the Trend. And I'd also like to extend special thanks to the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy for their sponsorship. And I'd also like to thank the panelists for taking time out of their schedules to come share their expertise and experience. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Christian Giovanni, the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for NAPF, the Project Coordinator for Reverse the Trend, and Julian Ma. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Leah. And thank you, everyone, for coming out today. So indeed, so welcome to our event on examining the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. I am, you know, I'm really thrilled to be here because I'm actually an alum of Drew University and I studied political science and economics here at Drew. I graduated in 2009, a long time ago. We decided to host this event because we wanted to provide an opportunity for young people, especially from frontline communities. So here we have Benedict Kabo in Madison and then joining us via Zoom is Tamatoa, who is a Mahanui from Polynesia, to express themselves on the intersectionality of nuclear disarmament, gender, racial justice, as well as human rights. So as we all know, the world stands at the brink of nuclear annihilation. The US has around 5,428 nuclear weapons. Russia has 5,977, and many of these nuclear weapons are in a hair trigger alert. We're going to discover today that you know there are other countries that also have nuclear weapons, including the United Kingdom, which has 225, France, around 290, and you'll learn more about French nuclear testing in Polynesia. So it's China, 350, India, 160, Pakistan, 165, and North Korea, 20, and Israel, 90. And there's a lot of nuclear weapons that are around in the world on hair trigger alert. And we're trying very hard to motivate young people to become nuclear disarmament activists and change the world. So we're going to briefly watch a quick video about the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons by the ICRC. So just give me one second, please. Things are uh, horrifying and fascination with them. Fire models of shock waves and does help put out. We begin our story in the middle of downtown in a major city. People are going to work, studying for exams, are lost in their thoughts and daily lives. Right here, a nuclear weapon is detonated and time freezes. The first phase of the explosion happens within less than a second. In a millisecond, a ball of plasma hotter than the sun appears and grows in a fireball to more than two kilometers across. Within this ball, everyone is just gone. Think of water dripped onto a very hot pan. A sizzle, and then there's nothing. Most buildings, cars, trees, tacky sculptures, and people. All evaporated. First, the flash, an intense tsunami of light, washes over the city in an instant. If you happen to have your head pointed in the direction of the explosion, it renders you blind for a few hours. The heat of this light produces a thermal pulse, so energetic and hot that it just burns everything as far as 13 kilometers from the destination site. What this means is that everything in an area of 500 square kilometers that is able to burn, starts burning. Plastic, wood, fabric, hair, and skin. If you happen to be in reach of the thermal pulse, one moment you're on your way to work, the next moment you're on fire. Okay, do you ever walk into a room and completely forget why you're there? Yeah, totally. It begins. It happens in a few seconds. Most people will now first notice that something is wrong, but it's already too late for hundreds of thousands. The flash is followed by the shockwave. 
The heat and radiation of the fireball create a bubble of superheated and supercompressed air around it that's now expanding explosively. Faster than the speed of sound, creating winds stronger than hurricanes and tornadoes. Human infrastructure is no match for its power. Most major buildings within a kilometer of the fireball are just ground up down to their base. Only steel reinforced concrete is able to partially resist the pressure. In the surrounding... Snap like toothpicks. If you're outside, you get tossed away like a grain of dust in a tornado. The shock wave weakens as it travels outward, but still, about 175 square kilometers of houses collapse like they're made of cart, trapping tens of thousands of people who didn't have any time to react. Gas stations explode and fire spread throughout the rubble. A mushroom cloud made from the remains of the fireball, dust and ash rises kilometers into the sky in the next few minutes and casts a dark shadow over the ruined city. This violently pours in fresh air surrounding the city, destroying more buildings and providing an abundance of oxygen. It depends on the city what happens next. If there's enough fuel, fires may turn into a firestorm that burns the rubble, everybody trapped in it, and people trying to flee the devastation. Up to 21 kilometers from the explosion, people just like you rush to their windows to take pictures of the mushroom cloud, unaware that the shockwave is still coming at them, about to shatter their windows and create a blizzard of sharp glass. The third phase begins in the coming hours and days. We're used to the idea that help will come, no matter the disaster. This time is different. A nuclear explosion is like every natural disaster at once. There are hundreds of thousands or millions of people with serious injuries, lacerations, broken bones, serious burns. In the next few minutes and hours, thousands more will die because of these injuries. Countless people are trapped in collapsed buildings like in earthquakes or blinded by the flash deaf from the blast wave and unable to flee through streets impassable with rubble and debris. They're terrified, confused, and don't know what's happened to them or why. Most likely, many hospitals have been leveled along with all the other buildings, and most medical professionals are either dead or injured along with everyone else. The survivors lucky enough to have been in metro tunnels or standing in the right place to be unburned and unhurt won't have truly escaped harm yet. Depending on the type of weapon, where it explodes, and even the weather, an awful black rain can begin, with radioactive ash and dust descending on the city, covering everything and everyone. The invisible, malicious, silent horror of radiation takes its turn. Every breath carries poison to the lungs of the survivors. Over the coming days, the people who receive the highest doses of radiation exposure will die. There will be no help, not for hours, or maybe even days. Civilization doesn't operate when there is a total breakdown of infrastructure. Roads are blocked, train tracks warped, runways cluttered with rubble. No water, no electricity, no communication, no stores to replenish supplies from. Help from surrounding cities will have a hard time entering the disaster zone, and even if they can, the radioactive contamination will make it risky to get too close. After a nuclear attack, you're on your own. So, bit by bit, people emerge from the rubble, on foot, contaminated with radioactive fallout, carrying what little they may have left. They are slow, in pain, traumatized, and they all need food, water, and medical treatment fast. And the damage done by a nuclear weapon doesn't end when the fires burn out and the smoke clears. The hospitals in the neighboring cities are under-equipped for a disaster of this scale and overwhelmed with tens or hundreds of thousands of patients with serious injuries. In the weeks, months, and years to come, many of those who survived will succumb to cancers like leukemia. The reason no government wants you to think about all this is because there is no serious humanitarian response possible to a nuclear explosion. There's no way to really help the immediate victims of a nuclear attack. This is not a hurricane, wildfire, or earthquake, or nuclear accident. It is all of these things at once, but worse. No nation on Earth is prepared to deal with it. The world has changed in the past few years, with world leaders again explicitly and publicly threatening each other with nuclear weapons. Many experts think the danger of a nuclear strike is higher than it has been in decades. Governments tell their citizens that it's good that we have nuclear weapons, but it's bad when anyone else gets them. 
that it's somehow necessary to threaten others with mass destruction to keep us safe. But does this make you feel safe? It only takes a small group of people with power to go crazy or rogue, a small misstep or a simple misunderstanding to unleash a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. Exploding stuff in videos is fun. Exploding things in real life, not so much. There is a solution though. Eliminating all nuclear weapons and vowing never to build them again. In 2017, almost two-thirds of all the world's countries, supported by hundreds of civil society organizations and the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, agreed to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. It's not about who has nuclear weapons and who doesn't. The weapons themselves are the problem. They are deeply immoral and an existential threat to all of us. No matter what country you come from, no matter what political side you find yourself on, we need to demand that they disappear forever. This will not happen without pressure. If you want to be part of this pressure, there are things you personally can do too. Visit notanukes.org to learn more about nuclear weapons and what you can do about them. Good evening. Uh, my wish to uh, thank this is my question. I wish to uh, thank Drew University and uh, all of the organizers for the opportunity to participate in today's uh, panel and for the honor of sharing with you the nuclear legacy in the Marshall Islands. So on March 7, 1946, at the age of two, my paternal grandmother, along with 166 other inhabitants of the Atoll and the Northern Marshall Islands, um, departed their homeland with all their belongings. U.S. Navy Commodore Ben Wyatt told my people they were doing so for the good of all mankind. The exchange between Wyatt and the Bikinians was filmed and shown worldwide and portrayed as the U.S. asking permission from the Bikini people. The American administration did not want to be accused of forcefully removing people from their ancestral land. However, the decision had already been made in Washington months before. And with powerful warships anchored in the lagoon, my ancestors knew that no was not an acceptable answer. Many Bikinians trusted the US and believed they would, they would return home. That day on Bikini would be my grandmother's last in her ancestral homeland. So if you know the details behind the bombing and the personal stories of those directly affected, However, imagery of the nuclear testing at Bigani has become part of pop culture. One of the most iconic images of the nuclear era is this image of the second detonation, Crossroads Baker, with its mushroom cloud and island setting. It is depicted in posters on t-shirts and in movies. The lands of Bigani, the home of my grandmother and ancestors, is today better known as a two T swimsuit. It has been trivialized and monetized by a Texas beer company and by one of the most recognized cartoons around the world, SpongeBob SquarePants, who live with other mutants under the sea at Bikini Bottoms. So on March, uh, on March 1st, 1954, the United States detonated its largest nuclear weapon, Castle Bravo, which rained down fallout on inhabited atolls. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States detonated 67 large-scale atomic and hydrogen weapons in the Marshall Islands, as equivalent to 7,200 Hiroshima bombs, or 1.5 Hiroshima bombs every day, for 12 years. The combined destructive force of radiation contamination unleashed by these nuclear weapons vaporized several islands, forced communities to relocate, and rendered numerous islands and atolls unsuitable for human habitation. It also produced a litany of radiation related illnesses thyroid, stomach, liver cancer, and leukemia. Women had miscarriages or gave birth to severely deformed babies with translucent skin. Some women birthed what was described as clumps of grapes, or what they called jellyfish babies. 
Some babies had elongated heads, like one of the cartoon characters in Bikini Bottoms. Birth defects and cancers are still common in our community. And now for people whose ancestors frequently lived into their hundreds are dying young due to illnesses like diabetes, brought on by a drastically changed diet, a consequence of forced removal and changes in our traditional lifestyle. The Marshley story is much more than what is portrayed in pictures and the spectacles of the bomb or one of victimization. The Marshley story is also one of activism. So I'm often asked by people worldwide, including Americans, you know, how can I help your community? And for those of you who want to advocate for the Marshallese people and other affected communities harmed by testing and weapons development, I welcome you to advocate with us. Learn about our history and listen to our stories. The Marshall Islands is more than a mushroom cloud. And though the Marshallese people have been exploited and victimized, we are also activists, act, activists and advocates of a nuclear free world. Marshallese have been addressing and raising awareness about the devastating consequences of nuclear testing in our islands since the testing period. So on the, the 20th of April, Marshallese leaders submitted a petition to the United Nations requesting a halt to nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands because of the increasing number of Marshallese who were removed from their lands and the growing number of those who suffered from radiation sickness. However, the United, States, the United Nations allowed testing to proceed. A second petition from the Marshallese people in 1956 called for the discontinuation of the US nuclear testing program because of its impact on Marshallese bodies, environments, and culture. At that time, Marshallese were not passive victims but sought the role of active agents of change, one that the youth of the Marshall Islands have taken up. And since the late 1950s, the international community and the United Nations have played an important role in nuclear nonproliferation. The United States stopped testing in the Marshall Islands in 1958, due in part to public awareness of the dangers of nuclear weapons testing. Despite test bans and treaties, we all continue to live with risk not only through the, the threat of nuclear weapons use, but due to the continued development of nuclear weapons, which disproportionately impacts communities of color. I migrated with my family to Arkansas when I was six years old. And like much of the rural South and Midwest, Arkansas is a red state. And many people don't believe in climate change and overwhelmingly support personal uh, ownership of guns and an expansive role of the US military, including nuclear weapons development. As one can imagine, we don't have many uh, financial supporters for our nuclear and climate justice work. We face an uphill battle, but we are not deterred. And so I encourage huh? you to engage with us, listen to our stories. Uh, and you the email address. My grandmother is still with us but she will never be able to return to Bikini Atoll and be buried next to her ancestors. However, it is my hope that she and all other Marshallese elders will see nuclear justice achieved in their lifetime. And so as you, I encourage you to learn the stories behind the individuals, the peoples around the world who have been affected by, by the nuclear legacy. The case for a nuclear free world is not just about wars and weapons, it's about people and their stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benetech. So next we will have Pamatoa, who is an Equity Rises intern with um, Reverse the Trend and the Marshallese Education Initiative. Just give me one second, please. Hamato, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Sorry. Say it again, Christian. Unfortunately, we're having technical difficulties. Hamato, we still can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me right now? 
Yeah, I think on Zoom you can hear me, guys, because oh, okay. I can help you. Thanks, man. Can you hear me right now? What about now? Hi, hello. Okay, <laughs> thank you. This one? Yeah. Hmm. Some speaker audio. Oh, okay. Tamato, we can hear you. Can we hear him? I just heard him. I can hear you. Oh, Go now ahead. now it's working. Thank you. Okay, great. I was afraid. <laughs> yes. Can everyone see Tamato? Can we? Spotlight him. Okay, great. Okay, Tamatoa, please present. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for this uh, connection. And I think we had, uh, uh, you know, difficulties uh, with this technology, but never mind. And uh, now we are all set. So it's a great pleasure for me, guys, to be here with you. Thank you again, Christian and the Drew University for this opportunity. Uh, I'm pretty glad and honored to be here with you guys. So on behalf of all my family, all my community, I want to say you, Yorana. Yorana means uh, good morning, good afternoon. But it not only it means uh, good morning or good afternoon, but it also means in um, indigenous way, uh, we wish you uh, the life. We wish you to be alive. So my whole community wants to wish you to be alive. So thank you again. Um, regarding the subject I'm going to share about, uh, as Christian asked me, uh, I'm going to talk about the legacy of French nuclear testing in Maohinui and the importance of the total prohibition, the TPNW. I just want to remind us guys that Maohinui is the indigenous name from, for French Polynesia. So I usually invite all my friends, you know, all over the world to, you know, just uh, use this uh, indigenous name. So I'm also inviting you guys. So talking about, speaking of uh, the legacy of nuclear testing and now over 50 years of testing, I uh, just want to remind us that uh, historically speaking, uh, we had 193 nuclear bombs uh, here in Maohinui. Uh, 46 were atmospheric and 100 47 were underground. So from 1966 to 1996, the French government just exploded uh, 193 nuclear bombs on our island islands, and particularly on Moruroa and Fongatofa islands. So it stopped on 1996, the year I was born. And here we are, 26 years later, advocating for nuclear justice. So it's not only me, but it's my whole community. And we are doing that for the whole community. And it's really important for us as uh, people are, you know, dying. And in, it's a great, you know, it's a huge impact on our society. Um, many indigenous people were involved as workers on nuclear test sites and as well as, as, well as French militaries also. And uh, speaking of legacy, um, the nuclear testing period has shaped our whole society. Historically speaking, politically speaking, environmentally speaking, and particularly socioeconomically speaking and health speaking. So it has a huge impact of colonialism. And in this way, you know, now we need to decolonize our mind, decolonize our way of living, 
and it's you know really important and we want to to educate our people to educate the next ter- generation on you know the way on how we can decolonize our minds so for this for this part, just for today, I want to mention and to talk about two specific legacies. The first one is the socioeconomic legacy. So the um, with the nuclear testing period, our you know indigenous people just left their traditional activities like fishing, crops, or you know planting veggies or fruits, and they were directing to Western activities. They were like employees in the nuclear, on the nuclear test sites. And this uh, period where was based on the capitalism and which has increased uh, the purchasing power uh, where people were buying in grocery stores, they were buying cars, etc. So now, um, 50 years later, we have like socioeconomic struggles. Uh, it's really complicated for people to, to get job. It's really complicating, um, you know, to, to find solutions or to, to, to be involved in something correct or precise. Uh, and talking about the socioeconomic concerns, I want to mention the radiation concerns concerts from nuclear testing. And I just want to take a sample on how we can understand the socioeconomic uh, challenge that people are going through. For example, we can take the sample of a woman, of a woman who got 60 years old, who discovered a couple of years ago that she got uh, breast cancer. And she discovered that at her 40s, and when she got into cancer treatment from 20, 2016 to 2021, so during six years, she has like, you know, she was like going through her cancer treatment and uh, she passed away in 2021. So at, let's say during the six years, she was like going through this cancer treatment. And at the end, like in 2021, she just passed away. So during that time, it was really complicated for her because she need to be by herself uh, some drugs. She need to be present during each treatment. And it's really, it's, it's really expensive sometimes. And, you know, she needs to get the support of her family to, to go through. And we had also the compensation system, which is managed by the seven, the uh, French, you know, system. Uh, and it's a big deal to go through and to get a positive uh, answer from this organization. So it means that uh, when she had, she discovered that she got a radiation induced cancer, uh, her breast cancer, so paying paying for the drugs, even if a part is paid by the local social security. And she needs to, to pay that. She needs, she, she, she was like, you know, facing struggles with her family because it's really pricey. And the way of living here in Maohinu, it's really pricey nowadays. So as I mentioned, not only the local uh, social security needed to pay was paying that she also paid a part of that so yes this this is a point that i wanted to mention to make it to make it easy second she also shared with me that uh you know it's a health challenge so this is the second point that i wanted to to highlight it's a health challenge because those drugs cancers when she was like going through the cancer treatment, were not really adapted to Maori people. So she reacted differently and she got some, you know, allergics. And so it means that, uh, you know, even if she, in, even if in Maori we, we had that kind of cancer treatment, or if even if uh, she's, you know, 
going through this uh, cancer treatment, we can conclude that it's not really healing the people, but only slowing down, slowing down her death. So socioeconomic and health legacies are both um, basis, the basis of my PS, PhD research. I'm still uh, writing down my PH, PhD proposal. And, but I think I need to, I need to focus and I'm gonna focus on what and how does the affected community in Mahinui is going through regarding radiation induced cancers and particularly considering the socioeconomic and health challenges. So this research is not only, you know, it's not for myself and it's not by myself, but I'm supporting by uh, community here in Mahinui. I'm supporting by the church, by the Morue Tattoo Association and it's, you know, we are like going all together so as to, you know, to, to get justice and truth for our people. So I do acknowledge that also ancestors had been advocating on nuclear testing. And as youth, the young generation right now, we are just, uh, they, they passed on what they did and we are just, you know, keep uh, going, keep continuing what they did. So, so yes, that's what I can, you know, share with you guys about the legacies of French nuclear testing in Mahinui. And that's what uh, it's also important for us to, to go through the TPNW, to the total prohibition of nuclear uh, weapons in the world. I think, and we are all agree that uh, the articles six and seven, the six, which uh, mention and which supports the victim assistance and environmental remediation, and the seventh, which is uh, supporting the international cooperation and assistance. So both the TPNW is really important for us to get an international support and to design a partnership at an international scale. So the major issue we had regarding the TPNW is that we are not, uh, Mahinui is not, it's definitely not a state party, but we, so we cannot firm the TPNW because we are still belonging to the, to France. But we started with RTT Pacific and with, uh, we also talked with um, Jen Marie from ICANN France. We are starting to, you know, find solutions. So the TPNW, I just want to, you know, to say again that the TPNW is really important for us and we are, we, we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best step by step so as to, you know, to, to get turf and justice for our people. So yes, that's what I wanted to share with you guys. So thank you for having listened to me and I wish you the best. Thank you so much, Tamatoa. So next we will hear a presentation by Anna Maria, who is the social media coordinator for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. She's also a student at Columbia University. And she had the honor of traveling to Polynesia over the summer to conduct background radiation with the K equals one Center for Nuclear Studies at Columbia. Please. And, and if we can ask um, our colleagues to please do screen share for slides. Are we screen sharing them? Or? They should be screen sharing. Sorry, just give us one second, everyone, sir. Uh figure out the hiccups in tech, but.
And so I'm going to kind of just elaborate on um, a lot of the points that Tamatoa has already explored with you guys, uh, just from a little bit more of, you know, the statistics and a little bit more scientific um, graphs and things like that. So just to reiterate, uh, between the years 1966 and 1996, the French government tested a total of 210 nuclear bombs. And according to declassified documents released in only in 2013, these three decades of nuclear testing exposed 90% of the 125,000 people living in Polynesia at the time to radioactive fallout. This presents obviously a serious public health issue as the international community is acutely aware of how radiation exposure produces rampant, can rampant cancer cases and a lot of other public health crises. So as reported by the World Health Organization in 2020, which is fairly recently, there were 1,668 new cancer cases and 927 cancer deaths in Polynesia. Proportional to the overall population, this means that 0.2% of, Poly of Polynesia's population was diagnosed with cancer in 2020, and 0.1% of the population unfortunately passed away from cancer in that same year. And so the U.S. National Research Council's Committee on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation estimated that for every millisievert of radiation exposure, 1.1 out of 10,000 people will develop cancer. They even went as far as to state that the 1.1 millisievert effective dose of radiation attributable to atmospheric tests received by people in the South Pacific would likely mean 1.1 new cancer cases per every 10,000 people. Yet when we compare the data that we just saw from 2020 by the World Health Organization, the number of new cancer cases in French Polynesia amounted to 30.7 people out of every 10,000. Considering the drastic difference between figures like 1.1 and 30.7, it is clear that cancer rates in Polynesia were grossly underestimated. A potentially useful way to discuss cancer rates is by comparative analysis. And so from the same World Health Organization collection of reports, 467,965 people in France were diagnosed with cancer in 2020 and 185,621 people unfortunately passed away from cancer in that same year. So France is a country with 65 million people though. So proportionately 0.7 of the French population was diagnosed in can with cancer in 2020 and let's remember that that same statistic in Polynesia amounted to 0.2%. From this, some may draw the conclusion and oftentimes attempt to draw the conclusion that the presence of nuclear testing has no notable impact on the public health of those populations. However, let's look at two specific types of cancer that are commonly associated with radiation exposure. And that is thyroid cancer and acute myeloid leukemia. And so, to kind of contextualize the studies that led up to this study, we can look back to a study done about the survivors of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And so according to a study of the atomic bomb survivors in Hiroshima, two conclusions were resolutely asserted. The first was that there is no doubt that the role of, the, of, the role of atomic bomb irradiation in the induction of leukemia. And the second is that the incidence of thyroid carcinoma increases among people exposed to atomic bomb explosions and that these effects may be seen, seen long after said exposure. These conclusions were further corroborated by studies conducted after Chernobyl that also identified radiation exposure as a well-established risk factor for both thyroid cancer and variations of myeloid leukemia. We will find that a few years after nuclear testing ceased, Polynesia had the highest incident rates of both thyroid cancer and acute myeloid leukemia. All right, so in a global comparison of thyroid cancer rates between the years 1998 and 2002, Polynesian females ranked number one in the entire world. The age standardized rate suggested that 37.4 women out of every 100,000 would develop thyroid cancer. And for the same period, French Polynesian men ranked fifth for thyroid cancer incidence.
And a similar result was found for myeloid leukemia, with Polynesian women exhibiting the highest incidence rate for myeloid leukemia globally. Six, out of, six women out of every 100,000 were expected to develop acute myeloid leukemia. And for the, same, for the same period, Polynesian men were ranked 70th for the same type of cancer. Medical surveys surveying the period between 1986 and 2001 have exhibited a relatively rapid increase in the incidence of acute myeloid leukemia. At the beginning of this period, it was said that the incident rate would be less than three. And at the end of this period, as you can see, in 2001, it was 5.45. And now this might not seem like a drastic difference, but the difference really is drastic because that proportion, you know, calculated out to the entire population that was affected by nuclear testing presents a serious and drastic public health issue. So while some may reference other causes in the induction of cancer, such as genetic susceptibility or, or whatever else has been used as a possible cause of these cancer rates that aren't nuclear testing, the prevalence of both acute myeloid leukemia and the highest rates of thyroid cancer in the world that is seen in areas that are affected by nuclear testing, it would simply be a disservice to our current knowledge of public health and radiation-induced diseases to not link the two as the consequences of nuclear testing. So now we will talk about, as Tomato also um, discussed, about the gendered reality of radiation-induced cancer. So the US National Academy of Sciences conducted a study of cancer risk among the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, the results of this study not only confirmed a correlation between radiation exposure and stark increases in cancer, but also display an interesting gender distribution. When we consider only those exposed to radioactive fallout between the ages of birth and five years old, the cancer rates for females is double the rates for males. Not to mention that there's a tenfold sex difference in exposure outcomes across the life cycle. This corroborates findings in Polynesia that suggest that nuclear testing has had drastic implications on women, and even more specifically, those women who were exposed to radioactive fallout as young children. And that really does explain why we must pursue um, we must pursue these types of victim assistance for the generations that have followed. So now, if we go back to the two graphs we used before to illustrate Polynesia's leading cancer rates, you will notice that both are based on the rates of cancer in women specifically. The results across cases are consistent. Women who are exposed to radiation due to nuclear weapons at a young age are more likely to develop, to develop cancer at some point in their lives than any other demographic. However, this doesn't necessarily mean childhood cancer. Now, we know that as children are growing and their cells divide at rapid speeds, the DNA, the DNA is more likely to experience damage, but we may not see results and we may not see the results of that DNA damage until later in life. Whether it be children who are exposed to ionizing radiation and developed cancer in childhood or children who receive genetic mutations passed on by their parents, we must not let the time pass since active nuclear testing to stop us from seeking justice from those whose essential health is implicated by the French government conducting nuclear testing. Now, many academics will often say that there are limitations to evaluating cancer rates um, as there can be different factors that affect our analyses. However, the reality is that the data is there and we've seen over the years that the comparative analysis between Polynesia and other countries have still shown that radi ionizing radiation found in those places in the world has affected the public health state. Um, and that's really the basis, kind of the scientific basis for why we need to see all these reforms that Benetech and Tamatoa and I'm sure um, Seth and Heine will also discover and will explain a little bit more about how we can use these findings to mobilize and really accomplish a nuclear free world. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you so much, Anna Maria. So next we have Hannah, who will be Khan, Khan who is going to be talking about gender, nuclear weapons, and human and human rights. So please, the floor is yours. I should mention that she's the UN Advocacy Fellow for Outright Action International and a former intern of the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. Thanks so much, Christian. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here tonight. Um, as Christian mentioned, I'm currently a, a UN Advocacy Fellow at Outright International, where I advocate for LGBTIQ rights at the UN. Um, I'm also a Drew alum. I graduated from here in 2017, um, so I'm very happy to be back here. Um, so today I'd like to talk about how human rights law conceptualizes nuclear weapons and briefly discuss um, how certain groups of people are disproportionately affected by nuclear projects. And finally, um, how I think social movements can and must work together towards nuclear disarmament. So historically, nuclear disarmament has been conceptualized under humanitarian law. Humanitarian law applies um, during armed conflict. But I also think it's important to look at human rights law, because unlike humanitarian law, human rights law, um, it comes into effect not only during armed conflict, but also during times of peace. And this really matters with nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons remain a threat during times of peace. And as my colleagues have already alluded to, um, the effects of nuclear radiation exist before and after nuclear projects. Um, are, are in operation. So one of the main UN human rights treaties, which almost all countries have signed on to, is called uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, they also call that the ICCPR. The UN loves their acronyms. Um, and Article 6 of the ICCPR uh, is about the right to life. And it says that every human being has the inherent right to life and that right is protected by law and it can't be infringed upon. Now, this right, you can imagine, is an extremely important one because, of course, a prerequisite to enjoying any and all human rights is being alive. Um, so this should come as no surprise. Um, but of course, this is really put at risk by uh, nuclear weapons. So the Human Rights Committee is this independent body of experts that oversees the implementation of this treaty, of the ICCPR. And um, they issue something called general comments. And general comments are authoritative interpretations of the treaty. And people who sign on to the treaty, states that sign into the treaty also have to abide by what this committee um, says under their general comments. It's considered part of the human rights law. So in general comment 36, which was issued in 2018, the Human Rights Committee focused on the right to life. And in that comment, they specifically said that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is a violation of the right to life. They also said that states have to reduce their nuclear stockpiles and they have to provide reparations to victims who have been affected by the testing or the use of nuclear weapons. So the, the call for reparations, which I think is really important, it was echo, echoed in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also known as TA, TPNW, as I said, UN loves their acronyms. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about this treaty because I have much more qualified uh, colleagues on this panel who are going to tell you more about it. Um, but it was a really important development under international law. Um, and Article 6 of the treaty, um, as um, I know Tamatoa mentioned, uh, says that states must provide victims with assistance, and that the assistance has to be both age and gender sensitive. I also want to let you know that this is on low battery, so if there's a way to plug it in, that's great. <laughs> um, so here, not only is there a focus on providing reparations to victims, but also making sure that victim assistance takes account of the different ways that different people are impacted by nuclear weapons. The International Court of Justice um, is a court that hears legal cases between countries. 
And it has also recognized the importance of responding to the impacts of nuclear weapons on different populations. So the court said in an opinion that the consequences of nuclear weapons, and this is a quote, have a disproportionate impact on women and girls, including as a result of ionizing radiation, end quote. So that really spoke to Anna Maria's research. Um, and ionizing radiation is the radiation that is emitted when um, nuclear weapons and nuclear uh, technologies are produced. And it remains in the environment long after the test or the use of the weapon is used. And I think this focus on the gendered impacts of nuclear weapons, which Anna Maria already alluded to, is really important. Because even though everyone suffers as a result of nuclear weapons, the truth is that the effects of radiation are not felt equally. So as the ICJ, sorry, the International uh, Court of Justice, um, here I'm going with the acronyms now, uh, mentioned women are uniquely impacted by nuclear radiation, and particularly those women who are within the communities that have borne the brunt of nuclear projects. So as Anna Maria mentioned, women and girls are twice as likely as men and boys to contract and die from cancers that stem from radiation poisoning. They're also more likely to experience thyroid disease, and the radiation accelerates menopause. Um, it causes um, high chances of miscarriage, of stillbirth, of premature births, and of um, birth abnormal abnormalities, as Benetic already spoke to, I think, really saliently. Um, and women who do give birth, due to all of these complications, face a lot higher risk of um, maternal mortality. And then once a woman does give birth, uh, radiation has been found in breast milk, so it can be passed on to further generations. It's also worth mentioning that psychologically, it's been found that women have higher rates of mental illness and stress after nuclear events. And women are more stigmatized um, in societies uh, than men after um, nuclear testing uh, under the idea that they're, they've been contaminated. So the gendered effects of nuclear radiation are compounded by and coexist with other forms of discrimination which stem from nuclear projects. As some of my colleagues like Benetic and uh, Tamatoa have already spoken to, certain communities have been targeted for the siting of nuclear projects and are particularly impacted by the ill effects of the radiation that results. Um, and this is particularly the case in indigenous communities. And you can see that uh, right here in the United States because the US has consistently and almost exclusively cited nuclear, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, hold that thought. <laughs> Okay, so as I was saying, the um, US has, all, has consistently and almost exclusively um, cited nuclear projects on indigenous land in territories that the US controls, including the Marshall Islands. Um, and this includes uh, not only where the US has tested nuclear weapons, but also where it mines for uranium, which is needed to produce nuclear, and uh, where it stores its nuclear waste. And this isn't even a relic of the past. Just last February, um, a US Court of Appeals greenlighted a new uranium mine um, in Arizona, uh, in an area where an indigenous community lives. So I think that the disproportionate impact on indigenous peoples and on women highlights a really important truth about nuclear weapons. And that is that these nuclear weapons aren't siloed in and of themselves, but they're part of a much larger world order, which privileges a few powerful actors by wreaking violence on everyone else. They're part of a patriarchal order, which associates the, position, the possession and use of deadly weapons with a masculine power. It's part of a racist order, which disproportionately tests and uses nuclear power on people of color. It's part of a colonial order, which um, not only tests and uses weapons 
so uh, often on indigenous land, but also tends to frame non-nuclear capable states as unable or irresponsible to uh, handle um, the possession of nuclear weapons while upholding nuclear states' um, oppressive security apparatuses. And they're part of a hyper-capitalist order, which is destroying our planet, our water, our air, while spending billions of dollars enriching private corporations who maintain nuclear arsenals um, instead of providing people with the things that they actually need to live. So as a consequence, I think that nuclear disarmament has to exist side by side with other human rights movements, including feminism, anti-racism, anti-colonialism, anti-poverty, and climate protection. And human rights activists are already doing really great work fighting for nuclear disarmament alongside and as a part of other social movements. I think Reverse the Trend is a great example as a youth and frontline community-led initiative addressing the interwoven threats of nuclear weapons and climate change. There's also a really long history of feminist organizing against nuclear weapons, including long-term peace encampments that have been made uh, in order to disrupt military operations. And many indigenous activists, which have already been spoken about tonight, um, have also long held that nuclear weapons are part of the colonizations of their lands and peoples and have resisted nuclear testing and uranium mining uh, on their territories. So I think that only by working together intersectionally like this, are we going to be able to dismantle the really dangerous nuclear apparatus and enforce human to take the ledge. Great. So finally, we have um, Seth Sheldon from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and a board member of the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Weapons. So we'll talk about the historic treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, TPNW. So. How do I get my slides? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Close. Well, thanks. I mean, I'm not far from New Jersey. Um, uh, yeah, it's really great to be here with you. I, I, I hope that whatever other notions you may draw into this room, that even after these first few presentations, some of your preconceived ideas may be changing. Um, you know, before today, if I had asked anyone, I hope, uh, you know, if I'd asked anyone how many times nuclear weapons have been used, you, many of you may have.
Uh -huh. Okay, let's plug the charger okay. in because they're not working. No, that should fix it, right? Yeah. We were muted. No, we were muted, so now it should work. Yeah. Okay, but we're also on 5%. Oh, no, it's not plugged in? They're not looking through the webcam. Mm -hmm. So let me make right. new so host. <laughs> This seems like a good opportunity to say that the command and control systems of the U.S. and all nine nuclear armed states are run by computers. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll show the sets. Okay. Well, still paper. And that if you examine what we know, and there's so much we don't know about nuclear weapons programs, we see hundreds of close calls involving mistakes, accidents. Uh, all of the experts or, who have been in the system leave the system and say that the reason that we haven't seen the end of humanity is not deterrence, it's dumb luck. And that that's what we went through the Cold War and that kept us alive is luck as much as any kind of political strategy. So let's remember that when we talk about deterrence and real politics, which we can get to um, if we ever get these slides. So, okay, but we've heard a lot about um, the, the this this impact that nuclear weapons have had, uh, and as Benetech and, and, and others and Kamatoa have said um, and demonstrated, these are not just stories about victimization. There are also stories about activism, decades of activism, to bring us to a safer future. And we are at a historic moment in that pathway towards something saner or something better. And that's where I get to tell you about the TPNW. I mean, if these slides come clear, what happened here? Okay, I think I can do this later. No? Hang on. Yeah? Okay. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Seth Sheldon. I am the United Nations liaison for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. As Christian said, I'm also on the board of the Lawyers Committee of Nuclear Policy. Um, my background's in law. I teach law at CUNY Law um, and in arts, but I won't get into that now. Um, and um, I'll tell you a bit more about ICANN, but let's make sure I can tell you about the treaty because that's what we're all here about. Uh, Sunday, this Sunday is the second anniversary of this young treaty's entry into force. This is it, I'll give you a couple. I only brought a few copies, I'm afraid, but um, those of you online, you could easily find it on ICANN's website. Uh, here, I'll just pass these out and uh, you can peruse them as I speak. Uh, it is, in short, if I don't have time to say more, the first ever global, globally applicable prohibition treaty uh, that bans comprehensively and categorically anything to do with nuclear weapons, anything along the life cycle of a nuclear weapon. It is something that uh, civil society in many countries have been working for for ever since 1945. Uh, and yet, uh, how many of you had heard about it before today? Uh, well, some of you, I hope, yeah. But I think those of us who aren't steeped in this issue probably haven't. The news doesn't talk about it very much. I'd like us to consider why. What's wrong? So sorry. We signed us up. Uh, oh, we're out of the zone. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah, just continue. Okay. <laughs> well, this was the most important slide because it's the sort of thing that is hard to listen to, I think, um, without a bit of uh, uh, help from the. Uh, but um, I, I'll pull up the slide again, but it's just the slide basically breaking down this treaty that I'm handing out. Uh, it basically uh, outlines what it does and how it does it. Uh, you know, the preamble, Hannah just gave this presentation on the, the relationship of human rights law to nuclear weapons. Uh, the preamble is sort of a, uh, a beautiful document, even if it stopped there, uh, that I think addresses everything you've heard today. It talks about the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls, um, it talks about the suffering of the Japanese survivors, the hibakusha, 
uh, it talks about the fact that this treaty has an imperative, not just an international human rights, sorry, international humanitarian law, which is, I'm trying to pull this up, which is sort of, as Hannah was saying, historically, what we look to for uh, laws relating to uh, weapons and why can't I make this work? Oh, you're making it work. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, it's not just that, it, but it also recognizes the relationship of the of nuclear weapons to international human rights law as well. Um, and um, and then when we get to the meat of it, the prohibitions, Article One. Basically, anything, as I was saying, anything in the life cycle of a nuclear weapon now prohibited under international law for the very first time, um, anything related to developing, testing, production, manufacture, uh, acquiring, stationing, transferring, uh, pos possessing nuclear weapons, stockpiling nuclear weapons, using nuclear weapons, of course, also threatening to use nuclear weapons. So put a pin in that because that relates to a lot of current events um, and what we've accomplished already. And also, assisting anyone to do anything relating to the pro prohibited activities, which again, we'll come back to if I have time, because it relates to actually one of the ways in which this treaty is having an impact already, even on states that oppose it and won't say they will join it like the US. Um, okay, so, oh, but of course, especially relevant to some of the presentations we heard before, this is the first treaty in the entire architecture and all the all the agreements that have been made uh, relating to nuclear weapons in the past 70 years, this is the first treaty that has something to say about addressing the needs of affected communities. It has provisions about providing assistance to those who have been harmed by nuclear weapons and also to remediating environments that have been affected by nuclear weapons use and testing. Uh, so that's quite historic. Uh, and it provides a framework for total elimination. Uh, basically in terms of requiring states that possess nuclear weapons to destroy them, requiring states that host nuclear weapons for other countries to get them out of their countries and verifying that this has been done and safeguarding that it won't be, these weapons won't be returned to, uh, returned to those countries. Um, okay, let's, let me just move on here. I I'm like, feel like I'm not in control. I'm in You're in charge, okay. Uh, on July 7th, 2017, that's when the treaty after the after the year of 2017, when we were negotiating it, uh, they took a vote on the text that was adopted. 122 states voted in favor of adopting the treaty to one against. So that at that time was a very clear uh, decision from the vast majority of the world that they wanted to see this treaty adopted that they wanted to bring about the end of nuclear weapons. Um, and it was one of the coolest days in my life, although I'll get to another cool day in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I'll just tell you where uh, the treaty is. Uh, next slide. Um, so it was adopted in July, 2017, like I said, uh, opened for signature in September, 2017. Uh, I didn't put a little bullet in there, but uh, just I'll come back to this also. Another cool day in my life was a few months later in December 2017, when we were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for our work to advance that treaty and get it adopted and to spread to raise awareness for the for any consequences um, for the humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons that really inspired us to keep going, of course. Uh, and the treaty would not become law until 50 states ratified it. That happened uh, over the objections of many of the possessor states, of course, over the predictions from many people, as we've seen at every step along this way, that this treaty would not be adopted, would not be enter into force, uh, would not have the support of uh, the states that eventually joined it. Uh, we're constantly being told that we can't do what we're doing, but we're doing it. Uh, so then the 50th state ratified in October 20, 2020. Treaty enters into force by its terms three months after the 50th state adopts. That happened January 2021. Um, and then, this is so exciting. I don't know where we're going. Uh, and, then, um, and, and then I've cut to today, where we now have 68 states parties to the treaty. Are you, who's I'm doing it? You're not in control. Okay, hold on. Um, yeah. All right, well, you just have to assume that 
the, what I'm saying is up on the slides. I'm not making it up. Uh, 68 states parties to the treaty today. Uh, 92 countries have signed it. The 92nd country signed it last week, actually. Um, and now we're looking towards the treaty's second anniversary, as we said. The first meeting of states parties happened in June. That's the first time that the countries that at the time had joined it so far got together in Vienna, Austria, to say, okay, let's take this forward. We're, you know, Let's implement it. They adopted a 50-point plan to implement the treaty that we're now taking forward and adopted a very powerful declaration that condemned any and all use and threats of use of nuclear weapons. The second meeting of states parties won't happen far from here uh, in New York. Uh, and that's one way you can engage with this work, but we'll get to that soon. Uh, it will happen in, in November. Um, okay. And the next slide was going to be a bit about the way in which the treaty is having an impact, even on those countries that oppose it. Um, you know, and there's a number of things I could talk probably for an hour about uh, all of the ways in which we're seeing the impact already. Because, I mean, you would be forgiven for thinking, I suppose, as I'm speaking about, you know, okay, well, you know, as you heard, there are nine, and Christian introduced nine nuclear weapon states in the world. Have they joined? No. They don't even support the treaty. Um, I put a little pin in that nine nuclear weapon states, by the way, because there are five additional states that have nuclear weapons that are in their countries that they host five NATO states. So that's another thing when the news tells you all the times that nine countries have nuclear weapons, eh, there are five more countries in which nuclear weapons are hosted. Uh, and so we can probably, I think, fairly add them to the list of where nuclear weapons are. Um, none of those countries have joined this treaty. All of them say they won't. But uh, we have seen through uh, various ways through other treaties and as well, how you can have an impact on those countries even before they join, because they will join with your help. Uh, you know, I think like um, even on the day that it was adopted, you know, the US um, stood outside the UN where, which was kind of ironic anyway, uh, to see the U.S. being like protesting, uh, saying that not only that they, it's be along with France and the U.K., it's not only saying that um, they won't sign this treaty now, but they're saying they said that they would never join it, that these countries would never join it. And sometimes I think they show how much they're overplaying their hand. I mean, to speak for future generations, to speak for you, and to say that that would never happen. How can they say that? I mean, this is a democracy after all. And I think that it's up to us to advocate for what we know is the safer path uh, and for changing this framing of nuclear weapons as instruments of security and seeing them for what they are, which is actually making us all a lot more insecure and uh, framing this in terms not only of state security, but rather human security, uh, because these we're increasingly understanding have effects beyond the countries in which they're used and uh, threaten to destroy all humanity. And they will be used in war again if we don't get rid of them. But anyway, ways in which it's already having impact. Uh, norms, you know, um, at this point now, the majority of nations have now declared that nuclear weapons are illegal, possession and use are illegal. I said at the first meeting of states parties, we had this, uh, which happened in the midst of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Uh, we saw these states adopt this powerful declaration condemning all nuclear threats. And we have seen how that has impacted Russian behavior already, uh, both actions and words. Uh, now, obviously, we are far from our goal here, both in that conflict and in other, other dangerous conflicts. But I think that it's important to see uh, the way that norms work and make adjustments on behavior. Uh, and we've seen this with other treaties, um, just to, uh, you know, for example, um, take uh, like the mine ban treaty, which prohibits mine bans, of course, and the cluster munitions uh, treaty. These are also treaties that possessor states have said that they would never join. Um, and yet they have clearly in, way, in very documented ways affected the way that the possessor states have uh, used and not used and stopped using these weapons. 
Um, not all situations are equal. We'll see how um, it plays out differently with nuclear weapons, of course. Um, uh, in terms of um, hosting, I was saying that all these five other states that host nuclear weapons, you know, once, uh, and we're talking, by the way, about Germany, Italy, Belgium, Netherlands, Turkey, um, once it's not just about pressuring the nuclear armed states, but also possess pressuring these, these hosting states because uh, NATO knows and these nuclear armed states know the effect that it will have once uh, those states join the treaty on uh, changing the entire dynamic and structure of nuclear weapons. Let me just mention divestment. This is another one that perhaps is my favorite way in which we see the treaty already having an effect, um, particularly in the countries where nuclear weapons are a big business. Um, you know, I was saying how the U.S. didn't support the Cluster Munitions Convention. We got to stop to wrap up. All right, one, let me just give this example then. Um, cluster Munitions Convention, uh, the U.S. didn't join and hasn't joined, but due to the economic practicalities of uh, proliferating these weapons, uh, because the rest of the world has joined these treaties, the, it took sort of the rug out of the industry. In 2016, the last producer of cluster munitions, Textron in Rhode Island, shut down. And they said it was because there was no longer a market for them. Again, nuclear weapons are different, but I think it's very clear the way in which divestment works and can really affect change. We've seen uh, $4.6 trillion. Uh, have been removed from the industry already from banks and institutions that cite the CPNW. Um, okay, I'll wrap up. <laughs> uh, yeah, which? Yeah, okay. Um, all right. I promised Christian I would bring this. This is ICANN's Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, you're welcome to inspect it as you wish. Um, and uh, as long as you support the treaty, you can take pictures with it. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, I just leave you with a few things that you can do to get involved, which include um, working with your federal representatives to join the ICANN pledge, which they by which they declare their support for the treaty. Uh, your cities to join the ICANN cities appeal. New Jersey has already adopted in 2019 uh, through the general assembly, your general assembly. Uh, declaration that says they want the federal government to join the TPNW. And um, look up the Don't Bang on the Bomb report. Uh, schools are very invested in nuclear weapons. Check out our uh, Schools of Mass Destruction report. Um, and check out ICANW.org and where we have a lot more resources and more things we can tell you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, perhaps we can plug this back into the um, so they can see us. Okay, great. So I think they can see us now. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. I know that we're running out of time, but we do have a really, really great youth activist named Joey who will briefly talk about, you know, how you can all get involved. <laughs> One second. There's been a lot of one seconds tonight. All right, just read on. All right, well, on behalf of, so I'm a youth activist with Reverse the Trend, which is the youth initiative of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Um, I'd like to extend on behalf of Reverse the Trend Ah, sure. Um, on behalf of Reverse the Trend, I would like to extend an enormous thank you for our wonderful panelists. Can we get another round of applause for them, please? Thank you for coming tonight and sharing your experiences, your knowledge, and your wisdom. And I think everyone in this room will walk away with something um, that resonated um, tonight. Um, as the youth initiative of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, Reverse the Trend seeks to amplify the voices of young people like ourselves um, who have been directly affected by the twin existential threats of climate change and nuclear weapons. As the direct inheritors of this world, we, the students of Drew, um, are all members of this contingent. 
and it is clear that our voices are vital in the shaping of a peaceful and sustainable future for planet Earth, but our voice, the voices of young people are often excluded in such processes. At Reverse the Trend, we seek to combat this by opening doors for young people to be included and engaged in decision-making processes at the United Nations and all levels of government regarding international peace, security, and climate change. To continue this initiative, we believe it is necessary to establish campus-specific chapters of Reverse the Trend. We believe the Druze politically active student body and ongoing relationship with the United Nations positions it well to host a Drew chapter of Reverse the Trend. Reverse the Trend Drew would provide opportunities to engage directly with UN actors and institutions, professionals from a wide, a wide range of disciplines, such as those on this panel tonight, and peers at Drew who are passionate about securing a peaceful and sustainable future for planet Earth. Reverse the Trend Drew would embrace an interdisciplinary perspective on critical issues related to international peace, security, and climate activism. In the long term, we hope to bring a, Drew, a group of Drew students to the second meeting of state parties on the treaty uh, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, as Seth just mentioned, uh, in November of this year at the UN headquarters in New York City. So if you are interested in joining Reverse the Trend Drew, uh, please indicate your interest by signing the sheet on the table as you leave this hall tonight. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, have a good night and use this time now to network and meet everyone and grab some more pizza. And thank you. Thank you for coming. So on that note, I would like to thank everyone and many thanks to our very patient Zoom participants, you know, who are, you know, who stayed with us at about 22, 23 throughout the night. And yes, so on that note, let's um, please feel free to approach us, talk to us, and, you know, have a good night. Thank you.